Gary, that was lovely. Okay. All right. And a very special greeting to everybody worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad you could make it. We have a bit of time for fellowship downstairs after the service. So if you have time, please join us downstairs and get a chance to know us a little bit better where it's not quite so formal. A big thank you last night to everybody who helped out with chili, especially the ladies in that in the kitchen area there, making sure that they were always well supplied with with uh, buns and with Caesar salad and all the condiments that went with it. Thank you so much for all your help. To people that helped with setup, to people who helped with cleanup, uh, couldn't have got through the evening without you. Very big hand. We need to give ourselves a big pat on the back. It was quite an interesting evening. Wendy, do we have a report? $1,530. Wow. Very good, Wendy. $1,000. Awesome. All right. Very good. Who would have known that chili could have been so warm to our hearts? Okay. All right. We have we have Bible study coming up on Thursday night at my place. As always, you're more than welcome to attend. We'd love to see you there. It starts at 7.30. We have a time for uh, fellowship together and a little bit of time after the Bible study for some more fellowship time together. So if you're ready to join us on Thursday night, we're ready to see you there. Okay, so keep that in mind. Palm Sunday next week with some special music for you. And uh, then we have, um, after that, we have our Good Friday service on April the 7th. And we'll be worshiping together here at 1030. And again, some special music for you. And then, of course, we have on Sunday, we have the Easter Sunday service. So some interesting things coming up this week. Lots of work for us to do to get ready for it. Lots of everybody's heart to get in the right place to get ready for it, too. Then on May the 7th, we're going to have a combined worship service. Um, the five churches, Limehouse, Norville, Georgium, um, 
Acton and us. Okay, we're going to get together. We don't have all the details yet, but I will make sure that you have those details in lots of time so that you can make plans to attend. It's always a wonderful chance for us to get together with a big congregation and hopefully a choir. Okay? And I don't think I've got anything more unless somebody would like to add something. Okay then, Brian, it's up to you. Thank you, Irene. Lovely to see you this morning. We have some visitors with us who have, uh, used, to, used to live in the area and, and are back with visiting with us today, so thank you so much. We have, uh, we have Grandpa McDonald all the way from Prince Edward Island who is yeah. with us today. So happy to have him here. And I think some others are, kind of got tired out last night. Maybe they'll drift in as time goes on this morning. I just want to let you know right now so you can grab them. We're using the red hymn book this morning for all of our hymns. So, uh, so grab a copy of the red hymn book. And if you can't find one, put your hand up and someone will get them for you. Okay, shall we start? Together as we worship the Lord by saying, let us worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people. Amen. Let's stand together and sing from the Red Book, number 466. What a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, 
And Lord, you know all of us. You know where we come from. You know the burdens that we carry. Some that we we can share with each other, and some, Lord, that we can we can share only with you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our burden bearer. Our Lord Jesus said to cast all of our care on him, uh, to let him carry our burdens for us. And he told us that if we follow him, he will make sure that uh, any burden that we feel will be light because he will be carrying it along with us. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus became one of us. So you know all about being human. You, you know, it's not just a theory. You have been here, Lord Jesus. You have been with us, dwelt amongst us, felt our pain, felt our sorrow, felt our frustrations, felt betrayal, felt desertion, felt being loved and, and also being hated. So you know what it's like to be a human. And because of that, Lord, we praise you. We thank you that you ever took that mighty stoop down to where we are. We know, Lord, you did it so that you could lift us up to where you are. This Easter time reminds us of the, of the dramatic step that you take, that you took. You became as, as a baby, you grew up to be a man, and Lord, you took our sins and our sorrows upon yourself. You bore them, you bore the penalty for them, and you gave us life. We who were lost and in darkness and in danger and crying out for help. Lord, you came to our rescue. And Lord Jesus, you come to our rescue so often, so many times, and we forget to say thank you. We, we cry when, when things are going badly, but we forget to praise you when things are going well. And so this morning we want to remedy that. We want to thank you for the measure of health and strength that each one of us have. We thank you, Lord, for uh, for taking care of us financially, for providing for all of our needs. We thank you, Lord, for our families. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us children and grandchildren. We are so very, very grateful. And what a pleasure, what a joy it is to see the little ones growing up and learning and, and growing in joy and learning what it is to love and be loved. But Father, we do pray for this world in which we live. So many today are suffering. We remember the war going on, still raging in Ukraine. It's so easy to forget about it, to become sort of blasé about it. But Lord, we know that each of those dear ones is on your heart and we pray for them. And Lord, as our Lord Jesus taught us, we pray for those who are our enemies. We pray for those who hate us. We pray for those who would persecute us. Lord, we pray that they, by, by our reaction, by our love, may come to know the God of love. And now, Lord, as your people, as your family, help us to pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, Turn around, stand up, stretch, wave, say hello. God bless you all. Thanks for being here today. Let's sing together.
they won't come up, right? And, and then I read about a story for you. You know, Lachlan and, and Lincoln both are, are playing hockey now, and that's great. And I was just talking to them this morning, and they, they said that when they grow up and, and, and sign a contract with the Leafs for a gazillion dollars, <laughs> they're going to take care of us. Did, I, did you say that? No, I think you said you quit. <laughs> that was it. Our prayer, our collective prayer, for all you Toronto Maple Leafs fans, our prayer is that the Leafs will finally win the Stanley Cup before they grow up, right? Because we want to still be alive to see it. God bless you. Thank you. And I read. Okay. Okay, guys, today we're going to talk about choices. Okay? Some choices are easy to make. Okay, like um, when you go to bed this morning, you had to decide what pair of socks to put on. Was that a pretty easy choice? Yeah, that wasn't earth shattering, was it? You know, like, did it really matter what pair of socks you put on? It didn't really matter much. Now. Other choices are a little more difficult. Suppose um, it's before supper time, and your mother's made a fresh batch of cookies. Oof, really good. But your mother says to you, uh 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 uh, no cookies before dinner, because it'll spoil your appetite. So, no cookies before dinner. And then your mother leaves the room. And you're all alone in that room. And there's the cookie jar. And it's got a whole bunch of cookies in it. Mom's not going to miss just one cookie, right? And God's not in her, and Mommy's not in the room, so she won't know if you took the cookie, right? But God will know, won't he? Yeah. So, what do you do in a difficult situation like that? You have to say, gee, um, I don't know what to do. Maybe I should ask God what he thinks I should do. God, what do you think I should do? I'd really like to have that cookie. But Mom said I can have them after supper. So it's not like I can't have one at all, right, God? So what should I do right now, God? Mm, do what your Mom says. Right. So I've got some eggs here to make some choices. They're, again, not earth-shattering choices. Some of them are Easter eggs. You can tell which ones are Easter eggs. How do you know which ones are Easter eggs? They're colored, right? Yeah. Okay. So if I asked you to pick an Easter egg that might have something fun in it, you wouldn't pick, like, that one, would you? No. <laughs> Why wouldn't you pick that one? That's a real egg. So, I mean, you certainly don't want to pick that one. <laughs> certainly don't want to pick that any it's right, no, it wasn't a real egg. I just did that on purpose to get your attention. Okay. So now, we have some choices to make. I know, everybody watch them. Okay, now we have some choices to make. Some of those eggs have something in them. Mm -hmm. And some of those eggs have nothing in them. <laughs> yeah. And oh boy, I'd really like to have one of those eggs that have something in it. So I'm going to ask for some advice. Well, you know, God's not going to help you with this one, but I'm going to help you with some advice, okay? I'm going to tell you, don't pick a yellow one. Don't pick a green one. So now, are you going to trust me with that advice? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Are you going to trust me? I said don't pick a yellow one and don't pick a green one. So do you trust me? Yeah, good for you. Okay, because that's the way it is with God. You say, God, should I, shouldn't I? And God gives you some advice and you say, mm -hmm. but you can always trust God to give you the right advice. And I did give you the right advice. So pick one, but don't pick a yellow one and don't pick a green one. You got something in? There's something in there? Okay, pick another one. But don't pick a yellow one and don't pick a green one. Is there something in? Don't pick a yellow one. <laughs> okay. And let's have a moment and let's talk to God. Dear God, 
Thank you for letting us make choices. Help us to make the right choices. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, you want to go downstairs and open them and see what's inside them? You do, okay. You want to check the yellow one? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's nothing in it. Was bad. Okay. Okay. Veronica's going to go downstairs with you, and you can open up your eggs downstairs. Talia, you want your legs back? The <laughs> yellow one. Well, thank you, and I read. One of the lovely little hymns that we seldom sing is, uh, is one of my favorites, actually. It's number 35 in the Red Book called Near to the Heart of God. You can just uh, keep your seats if you want while, uh, while we sing this. I'm going to stand up and, because I think maybe you don't know it that well, so I'll, uh, I'll sing it out so you can, you can catch on. Near to the Heart of God, number 35. And Irene, are you back there now? We're all set. Here we go. <laughs> Forever. He does not forgive us as our sins are 
above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as these pieces have so far as these pieces have passed, 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 as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows us that we have a heart, do we have a heart, and we have a heart. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower in the field. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you the angels, you mighty ones who do this day, and will obey this word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his heavenly service, servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his servants and their servants in the name. Praise the Lord. Our reading today for the sermon comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. You'll find this on page 1092 in the Pew Bible. Luke 13, 31 to 35. Hear the word of the Lord. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to the word of God. This ends our readings for today. Thank you, Gary. We've been singing every Sunday. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. It's it's in the in the red book number two thirty four. It's also on the screen. Let's stand together and sing it through. <laughs> Temple, they met an old lady named Anna, 
an old man named Simeon, and they prophesied that now they had seen the one whom God had promised for so long, one who would be a light to reveal God to the nations. In fact, the one whom God had sent to save the whole world. Luke is the only one who tells us about the next trip Jesus made to Jerusalem. It was with his parents when he was 12 years old. You remember that story. His, his parents lost him. A terrifying experience for them. But, but three days later, they, they found him. And, and where did they find him? They found him in the temple. Going about my father's business, so he told them. Well, when his earthly father, Joseph, got him back home uh, to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, he put Jesus back to work in the family business. And Jesus, uh, Jesus stayed there in the carpenter's shop, working quietly, obediently, diligently for the next 18 years until he was ready to get to work for his heavenly father. That's brought us up to date so far, right? And so Jesus had spent most of his life in the territory of Galilee in the northern part of Israel. But then, starting at age 30, the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, tell us his story, each sharing their own memories from their own point of view, because they were there. In the case of Luke, who wasn't there, his own diligent reporting came about as a result of interviewing eyewitnesses to the events. So Luke was different and sort of special. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us only about the adult Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. But John, who wrote much, much later from the point of view of, of age, he was probably in his 90s, and the last of the disciples, he tells us in his gospel that Jesus actually made three trips to Jerusalem before the final one. And so in our sermon text in, in Luke 13, where we see Jesus arriving at a hill overlooking Jerusalem and, and saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. You see, now it makes sense when he says, How often have I? How often? Because this was not the first time Jesus had stood there. It was not the first time he had wept over that lost city and the lost people that lived there. He had stood there before, looking down from his vantage point, probably on the Mount of Olives. Veronica and I have been there. And it's amazing the wonderful view you get of Jerusalem standing on that, on that hill just the other side of the Kidron Valley. You can just imagine him. Or can we imagine him? Not standing there ranting and, and yelling and shouting. I see Jesus standing there with tears streaming down his cheeks. I see him standing there with, with a heart broken because of the lost people there. Because Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew that they were going to reject him. He knew they were going to kill him. And he knew what was going to happen to them. Just under 40 years later, the Roman armies would wipe out Jerusalem completely. And not only wipe out Jerusalem, but they would wipe all of Israel off the map. And Israel would not appear again on the world stage as a nation until the year 1948. Amazing. Jesus knew. He wept. You can be sure Jesus is still watching over the world today. At this Easter time, Jesus is still pleading with the world, still longing for it, and, and still saying, How often I've longed to gather your children together. How long? Friends, today I wonder how concerned are we? 
over the state of our world? How concerned are we over our nation? How concerned are we over this community in which we live? There's a, a hymn in our in our red book, number 662, and I'd ask you to turn to it, I won't, but, but this is what it says. Let your heart be broken for a world in need. Feed the mouths that hunger, soothe the wounds that bleed. Give the cup of water and the loaf of bread. Be the hands of Jesus, serving in his stead. Blessed to be a blessing, privileged to care. Challenged by the need apparent everywhere. Where mankind is wanting, fill the vacant place. Be the means through which the Lord reveals his grace. Follow in his footsteps. Go where he has trod. In the world's great trouble, risk yourself for God. Let your heart be tender and your vision clear. See mankind as God sees. Serve him far and near. Let your heart be broken by a brother's pain. Share your rich resources. Give and give again. I bet you didn't know that it was in our book. Now there isn't, probably isn't much that, that we can do, given our age and and our strength and our growing lack of mobility that we all suffer. And as for finances, well, some may be able to give and some may not. But there is one thing, isn't there, that we can all do. No excuse. We can pray. We can pray. So this Easter, can we covenant with God that we will do that? We will really sincerely Pray, not for ourselves, but for the Jerusalem around us. We all know the Bible says that prayer can move mountains. Jesus said that. The question is, what will it take to move us to pray? That's the big question I ask myself. The slide you can't. You can't see it very well, I know we, we don't have the big enough screen to show it on, but this is the area where Jesus spent his whole life. It's not very, it's not very big, just a, 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 a tiny slice of the world. This is Israel, most of it. Jesus spent his life here. Uh, he traveled at one point just for a short time. He made one trip to to, to Tyre, which is on the, the coast of the Mediterranean. Just the one time, went there just for a day to meet a certain woman and her daughter, and then he came right back to this area, and this is where, where he worked. But from here, from this small area, Jesus changed the whole world. This is where he spent most of his life, most of his ministry. That's the Sea of Galilee where the arrow was pointing. So it was in that area in the villages around the Sea of Galilee. Now, in our text today, Jesus is traveling south. This is where we see him, the text that Gary read for us. It's in the territory of Perea. And then he continues southwest and crosses back over the Jordan River to the town of Jericho. We all remember what happened to Jericho? where Luke meets that mean, curious, little tax collector called Zacchaeus. Remember him? Luke's the only one that tells us that one. And then Jesus reaches the end of his journey. There's the city of Jerusalem. This is the final journey of his life on earth. But, but, this is not the end. Because he rose from the dead. Do you believe that? Can you say, I know it's not Presbyterian, can you say amen? amen? Amen. We believe that with all of our hearts. Now the territory of Perea, where we are today, uh, 
along with the territory of Galilee, back in those days was ruled by uh, a king by the name of Herod Antipas. Now, this was not the Herod, the one that killed all the babies in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Uh, that, his name was called uh, Herod the Great for some reason. History calls him Herod the Great. I think we would probably want to call him Herod the Slime Ball. But anyway, uh, he, he had a son, uh, Herod Antipas, who wasn't much better than his dad. Um, he, he was a wicked man, too. He was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. Remember that? Uh, for, for no reason at all. A horrible individual. Uh, you know, the things really have not changed much in our world today, have they? Where there are still wicked leaders still murdering the innocents. It's happening right now as we speak around the world. Here in, in Luke chapter 13, remember Gary read for us, uh, Jesus calls Herod a fox. Now, once again... I, I, I try not to take offense at that, but uh, uh, you can be sure that when Jesus called Herod a fox, it was not a compliment, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and remember, when Jesus called Herod a fox, it was because some of the some Pharisees came across the river and uh, told Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him. And Jesus' response was, in effect, tell that fox I've got work to do first. <laughs> I think actually Jesus was commenting on Herod's inability to carry out his threat to kill him. I, he publicly put this, this little puppet king in his place. Called him a fox, not a lion. A coward, not a king. Jesus was fearless. Oh, not to be a fox. <laughs> oh, to be a liar. Oh, to be like Jesus. And Herod and all the rest of his enemies were relentless. Remember on the night before Jesus died, he was sent to stand before this same guy, the same Herod Antipas. And it was this man who was, who was convoluted in his thinking about Jesus. He had heard that this man could perform miracles. And so when Jesus was standing before him that night, before he went to the cross, Herod demanded that Jesus perform a miracle for him. Remember that? And Jesus did not only did not perform a miracle, he wouldn't even speak to the man. He remained silent. And then that coward, Herod Antipas, got his revenge. He and his soldiers ridiculed and, and mocked Jesus. This was the one that dressed Jesus in an old royal robe, then sent him back to Pilate after they had beaten him. Herod Antipas and his cronies, they were the ones that made the crown of thorns. They were the one that ripped the beard from the face of Jesus and sent him back to Pilate where the final sentence was meted out. Get me back to the text. As Jesus stands on that hill outside Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, is coming fast. Jesus has a lot on his mind because he knows very well, he knows exactly what is going to happen to him. On that day when, when he went into to Jerusalem, when he would go into Jerusalem a week later, he knew what would happen. He knew he was, going to, he was going to meet a happy, expected crowd of people outside of the walls of Jerusalem. He knew that they were going to shout, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Come and save us now! Which is what Hosanna means. But Jesus also knew that 
just a week later, that there same crowd of people would shout, Crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. Same people, same crowd. And yet now, at this moment, all Jesus is concerned about are those weak, fickle, easily deceived, blinded people. People of Jerusalem. And all the people on earth today whom he loves. And his heart is broken. His heart is broken back then. It's still broken today. But back then, it was broken because he knew what was going to happen to him. As I mentioned before, he knew what was going to happen to, the, to that crowd, to those people, to their children and grandchildren. As I mentioned before, in, in, it was in 70 AD. History tells us the Roman armies wiped out Jerusalem. They wiped out Israel. And that nation wouldn't exist again for almost a thousand and a half years. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Nothing took him by surprise. And he faced it anyway. What'd you do? I'd run away like a fox. <laughs> I would. So Jesus' heart was broken, but not for himself. It was broken for them. And this, as I said, his, his heart is broken today. For a world that is centered on self and has rejected the command to love thy neighbor and to love thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind and strength. It's not happening today. The heart, his heart still breaks today for people who refuse to take the gift of life that he offers. As Luke tells us uh, in chapter 19, where Jesus says, I have come to seek and save the lost. There's nothing more sad and more ironic than someone who's lost and doesn't know. How is he going to save them? How is he going to do it? It looked like an impossible task for him, but for him it was not mission impossible, it was mission possible. He was going to do it. Over 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah the prophet wrote this. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. And this is the voice of, of the future Messiah speaking, by the way, through, through Isaiah. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like a flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Do you get that? That was written over 700 years before Jesus set foot on earth. But Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen because Isaiah was talking about him. The Bible is wonderful, isn't it? Isn't it incredible? If only the world could see it. Isaiah knew that the coming Savior, the Messiah, would be fearless. And he was right. What looked like defeat would actually result in victory one day. And so in the light of the fearlessness and the strength and the courage of Jesus, how strange it is that at the most critical moment of his life, <laughs> to hear Jesus compare himself to a hen. <laughs> On that fateful day, Jesus weeps over the city Cries out, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, 
How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. A hen. Female. A mother. But wait a minute. Aren't all women weepy and weak? I should duck when I say that. Don't, don't mothers run away and hide with the kids when things get tough? You don't think so? Well, of course, you're right. You know they don't run away and hide. And there's no way Jesus thought so either. Ladies, just to remind you that, that Jesus did more to elevate women than anyone before him or since. He made women equal with men. And in Canada, we didn't even give women the right to vote until the 1920s. I think Jesus would have done that. He loves us all. He respects us all equally. Now, as you all know, I've told you many times, we're living in a, you're living in a farming community here, and most of you have grown up on a farm or close to a farm. You know, I'm not a farmer. I'm not the son of a farmer. But I have heard that a hen has a variety of informative clucks. They might all sound the same to us, but they sound different if you're a hen. For example, a certain clucking sound will call her chicks to eat. Did you know that? Uh, and uh, whenever a hawk or a Another bird of prey flies over the barnyard. The hen sees its shadow. She will make a special clucking sound that calls her chicks together under her wings so she can protect them from danger. Wow, it's amazing. Now, if the hawk were to attack, then the hen would sacrifice her life for her chicks, as her mothers do. She would die, but they would live. You see, that's not weak. That's fearless. And that, perhaps, above all else, gives us the best look into the heart of Jesus. Fearless. Full of love. Willing to die. So that we can live. That's the story of Jesus. By God's grace, may we all seek to be like Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you give to the work.
give some back to you. And Lord, we know that you will use what we give to you for the furtherance of your kingdom so that the gospel message may continue to go forth from this place to serve this community and to serve this world. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for everyone who's giving today. And Lord, mostly, thank you for, for when you gave to us, you held nothing back. You gave everything. When you gave Jesus. Amen. An appropriate uh, response, I think, this morning is number 455 in the Red Book. I am thine, O Lord, and the chorus says, Draw me nearer, Lord, draw me nearer. That's our prayer for today. Let's sing it together.